Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Going to wait a little bit longer to get started. Let me know um, where you're watching from. Hopefully, you all had a great day. Got my Todd Galbraith featuring Anisha Figueroa playing in the background. Yeah, let me know where you guys are watching from. Got a fun topic tonight um, called Discerning the Spirit. So I'm excited. We'll try to get it within an hour. Um, but yeah, let me know where you're watching from and please share, share, share. Sharing is caring. Okay, give it about another minute and then I'll get started. Hopefully you guys are getting a lot less rain than we are here in the Carolinas because <laughs> we're under flash flood warnings, got, you know, tropical depression winds reaching our direction, and, and we just had a tornado warning a little while ago <laughs> while I was actually getting ready for this. Okay. Well, we're going to get started. So welcome, everyone. Um, to this lovely um, Facebook Live this evening. We're going to be discussing discerning the spirit, and I'm going to hush um, Anisha up for a little while so I can hear myself. <laughs> but um, I'm going to be discussing discerning the spirit. That is the topic for tonight. I have my little phone with my little trusty notes about that. And, you know, I was reading in my Bible um, the other day, and it was just one of those, boom, <laughs> and you just um, sort of pick something to read. And I landed on the story of Jehu. Jehu is such an interesting story, and, and welcome to you guys who are coming on. Let me know where you're watching from, and please like and share this. Share, 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 sharing is caring. Um, and, and so when, I, uh, when you think about Jehu, you always think about the man who killed Jezebel, the man who was anointed by Elisha to carry on what he was doing. You know, you hear people talk about the Jehu anointing, and that's awesome. It's phenomenal. I'm not doubting anyone or doubting anybody's message. Um, but I was just so grieved when I read the story of Jehu. It's a very interesting story. Um, if you guys follow my blog, then you know on scripture <laughs> because I don't have anything to say if it doesn't come from the Bible. So I'm, I've got some main text. So let's just pretend this is a little Bible study. Sorry if my earrings. I thought they were cute. So I start reading from 2 Kings um, 9. Let's see. Yeah, I am going to read this full passage. So 9 through 10. Um, and it says, and Elisha, or Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, get yourself ready. Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive at the place, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi. Go in and make him rise up from among his associates and take him into an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, thus says the Lord, I've anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not delay. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead, and when he had arrived, there were captains of the army sitting, and he said, I have a message for you, commander. For which one of us? And he said, for you, commander. Then he arose and went into the house, and he poured oil on his head and said to him, thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood 
servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel, for the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab all the men in Israel, bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. The dog shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Then Jehu came out to the servants of his master, and one said to him, Is all well? Why did this madman come to you? And he said, You know this man and his babble. (laughs) And they said, A lie. Tell us now. And so he said, Thus and thus he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then each man hastened to take his garment and put it under him on top of the steps, and they blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. Um, I am going to skip through a good portion of this because there is a lot of slaughter, <laughs> God ordained slaughter, but um, just Ahab had a lot of male family members, and so there was a lot of um, uh, slaughter in the name of God, um, which was appointed by God. Um, I will fast forward to uh, Jezebel's death in um, chapter 9, verse 30, and says, Now when Jehu had come to Israel, Jezebel heard of it, and she put paint on her eyes and adorned her head and looked through the window. As an aside, this is the only place in scripture we see Jezebel painting her eyes. So if you hear somebody construct an entire sermon on people wearing makeup or Jezebel painting her eyes, just throw it right out. Like an entire doctrine, an entire teaching on one verse. One, sexual seduction is a portion of the spirit of seduction in general. And that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, Verse 31, then as Jehu entered at the gate, she said, is it peace there? of your master. And he looked up at the window and said, who is on my side? Who? So two or three eunuchs looked out and said, then he uh, looked out at him. Then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down. Some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses and he trampled her underfoot. And when he had gone in, he ate and drank. And he said, go now see to this accursed woman and bury her for she is a king's daughter. So they went to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and palms of her hands. Therefore they came back and told him and he said this is the word of the Lord which he spoke by his servant Elijah the Tishbite saying on the plot of ground at Jezreel dogs shall eat the flesh of Jezebel and the corpse of Jezebel shall be as refuse on the surface of the field in the plot at Jezreel so they shall not say here lies Jezebel you move on to chapter 10 then you see all 70 of Ahab's sons are killed um, more and more family members are killed, more brothers killed, more of Ahab's family members killed, the worshipers of Baal are killed. Um, and I am going to read this passage on the worshipers of Baal till the end of chapter 10. Then Jehu gathered all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, Jehu will serve him much. Now therefore call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants and all his priests, let no one be missing, for I have a great sacrifice for Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu acted deceptively with the intent of destroying the worshipers of Baal. And Jehu said, Proclaim a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it. Then Jehu sent throughout all Israel and all the worshipers of Baal came so that there is not a man left who did not come. So they came into the temple of Baal and the temple of Baal was full from one end to the other. And he said to one in charge of the wardrobe, bring out the vestments for all the worshipers of Baal. And so he brought out the vestments for them. Then Jehu and Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, uh, went to the temple of Baal and said to the worshipers of Baal, search and see that no servants of the Lord are here with you, but only the worshipers of Baal. So they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had appointed for himself 80 men on the outside and had said, if any of the men whom I shall or whom I have brought Uh, into your hands escapes whoever lets him escape it shall be his life for the life of the other now it happened as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains go in and kill them let no one come out they killed with them with the edge of the sword then the guards and the officers threw them out and went into the inner room of the temple of Baal and they brought the sacred pillars out of the temple of Baal and burned them then they broke down the sacred pillar of Baal and tore 
tore down the temple of Baal and made it a refuse dump to this day. That's a trash dump, if you don't know. Thus, Jehu destroyed Baal from Israel. However, Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, that is, from the golden calves that were at Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in doing what is right in my sight and have done to the house of Ahab all that was in my heart, your son shall sit on the throne of Israel to the fourth generation. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart, for he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin. And um, I'll leave off there. So I know that was a fairly lengthy passage. Do you have more scriptures? But it's such a fascinating um, passage to me because this great man is anointed um, by the messenger of the prophet, the double portion prophet, <laughs> and he's anointed to kill Jezebel. He's anointed to kill uh, Ahab's and Jezebel's descendants. I mean, we're talking, you, they only had 70 sons. That's not including all the other male members of their household, all the leaders who may have been on their side, all the priests of Baal and Asherah, and all the worshipers. There's, I mean, that's a countless number of people. You know, the scripture does not tell us how many people they killed, and yet, this man, with all of his anointing, one breath later, decided to say, I'm going to worship Baal. What? I'm confused. Did not the Lord God Almighty <laughs> just anoint you to slay all of the Baal worshipers, the priests, the royal priests of Baal, and now you are then going to partake of the same sin that made them so wicked. It's absolutely astonishing to me that he would have the nerve, <laughs> the gall to do that. But um, as we'll see from my text, he was not alone in making these decisions. He was one man of probably several <laughs> who made decisions along these lines. And then as I was thinking <clears throat> about um, other uh, individuals in scripture, I was reminded of Gideon. I'm not gonna read the whole passage, but if you turn to Judges six through eight, you see the story of uh, Gideon, the angel of the Lord found him there in the wine press where he was hiding to thresh wheat. Uh, we hear about uh, Gideon and his 300, Ooh, I need a sip. <laughs> okay, we hear about Gideon and his 300 men and how they conquered um, their oppressors, the Midianites and the Amorites, I believe. Um, yeah, so they conquer their enemies, and these enemies are worshipers of Baal, more or less. By whatever name, they're worshipers of Baal. He destroys the altar of Baal. He becomes known as Jerubal, <laughs> and uh, this means contender with Baal. So he literally destroys the idol, the altar, if you will, of Baal in that area. And then when we turn to, um, to Judges chapter 8, and then we see his dealings um, with the Midianites. Where is it? Where is it? Let me find it in my notes. Okay, verses 22 through 35, it says, Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Then Gideon said to them, I would like to make a request of you that each of you would give me the earrings from this plunder, for they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. So they answered and said, We will gladly give them. And he spread out a garment, and each man threw it into the earrings from his plunder. Now the weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and purple robes, which were on the king's Midian, and besides the chains that were around their camel's necks. Then Gideon made it into an ephod and set it up in his, in his city, uh, Ophrah. And all Israel played the harlot there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his house. Um, if you skip down 
to verse 33. It says, so it was as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel played again the harlot with the Baals and made Baal bear with their God. Thus the children of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the house of Jerubal, Gideon, uh, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. So now we see not one, but two men who are anointed by God to destroy the enemy of God and of the people of God who turn away to Baal worship and then turn the people, the entire nation, over to Baal worship. And if that were not enough, we know the story of Balaam. I'm not going to read it. Turn to Numbers 22 uh, through 24, I believe. You see the story of Balaam. This is a man who is a prophet. He is a prophet of God. He hears from God. When, we, when you read the story of Balaam, the, the, the coalition uh, that the king sends him, the king of uh, Moab, or Midian, one of them, the Moabites and the Midianites are teaming up together against Israel. They see that the hand of God is on them. They fear the hand of God that is on them and says, okay, if I curse them, then I can overcome them because that's true. To an extent, um, if you curse, if you're cursed, you're not succeeding. Thank you for all the love, whoever that is. <laughs> um, and so, and, and please, if you're just joining me, like and share this. Um, please share this. Sharon is Karen. Um, and so he's um, being approached by the king's coalition from Midian and Moab. And they say, oh, if we give you this, will you come and pronounce a curse on Israel? And he's like, oh, I can't do that. No. Far be it that I should curse the children of Israel. And then he goes and asks God, hey, can I curse Israel? What? <laughs> and God responds. It doesn't say he had to wait. It doesn't say that, you know, he had to fast and pray for the Lord to respond. No, God responded immediately and told him, no, of course you can't curse my people. Are you crazy? He didn't say all that. That's the Desiree translation. <laughs> But he goes and he does this twice. And then the, co the coalition, which is greater and more noble every single time they come, uh, come again. And um, God's like, fine, go with them. Now, see, fellas in particular should know that this is not wise. Why? Because when you keep mentioning something to your wife <laughs> or your girlfriend or your fiance, and she's like, fine, go ahead and do it. Or if you have a mother, you know, and you keep asking her something, you keep asking her, mommy, can I do this? Mommy, 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 mommy. And she's like, fine, go ahead and do it. That is not good. <laughs> the moment you decide to do it, you are in trouble. Really, you're in trouble when she tells you to do it because she knows you're so set on going to do what you know good and well she doesn't want you to do. Your heart is rebellious fellas, children. <laughs> and so we see a very similar situation here. And so I will read part of this passage. Um, let's see. I'm reading verses 22 through 32. And it says, then God's anger, uh, and this is, what chapter is this? 22. Um, and it says, then God's anger was aroused because he went and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way uh, as an adversary against him. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that should be horrifying. That's, that's just terrifying. And he was riding on his donkey and his two servants were with him. Now, the donkey saw the angel of the Lord. How does the donkey have discerning of spirits? And the man of God does not. That's the message. <laughs> the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. And so Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that side. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pushed herself against the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. So he struck her again. Then the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place 
where there was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam. So Balaam's anger was aroused and he struck the donkey with his staff. Then the Lord opened the mouth of the donkey and she said to Balaam, what have I done to you that you have struck me these times? Now see, if your discernment wasn't working before, something should start working now when the animal opens up its mouth and starts speaking to you. This is not Eeyore. She does not speak on a regular basis. And then Balaam said to the donkey, because you have abused me, I wish there were a sword in my hand, for now I would kill you. This man has a temper tantrum. He has, he has issues. So the donkey said to Balaam, am I not your donkey on which you have ridden ever since I became yours to this day? Was I ever disposed to do this to you? And he said, no. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes. And he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and fell flat on his face. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you because your way is perverse before me. Now that should again be absolutely terrifying um, it's, it's evil. So perversion is not just dealing with sex. Just like I mentioned earlier about the spirit of seduction, the sexual aspect of the spirit of seduction is about this big. <laughs> it is one portion. Uh, it's one thing that falls under a large umbrella. So it is with the spirit of perversion. The, the, this said nothing about sexual perversion. It said his way was perverse before the Lord and the angel of the Lord, not even God, the angel of the Lord came out to stand against Balaam. Oh my God, how many warnings did Balaam have before that, even before the story we know of, that was a little nudge from the Holy Spirit. That was a little chastisement. That was a loving rebuke from the Holy Spirit that said, hey, you need to fix this. You need to handle this. You need to, you know, and we don't, you know, well, it doesn't come out and tell us, but when you read the story, you can infer that Balaam's uh, root was greed. It was greed. And so when you read on to uh, chapter 25 and so forth, and even in the book of Joshua, I believe around chapter 13, it says that he was slain as a soothsayer. And you can see why in um, chapter 24 or 25 of Numbers, because he decided to go back with the kings and we can infer the story. He decided to go back and meet. He saw that the hands of the Lord was on Israel. So what did he do? He teamed up with the nobles and uh, monarchies of these two neighboring regions and sent in their gorgeous, young, attractive women to seduce the men because he knew if I can get them to fall into sexual harlotry or adultery, then I can get them to fall into spiritual adultery. These people were covenanted to God. So this wasn't just straight up harlotry. This wasn't fornication. It's not like you single out here sleeping around. No, you're married. The Lord God is your husband. You're married and you have turned away and turned to something else. Because a lot of times where you find um, sexual immorality, you will find idolatry of sorts. It may not be a golden idol, you know, but you're going to find idolatry that I, uh, that, uh, that idol is probably lust or something along these lines. So what am I saying? What is the point of this? We see the case of Jehu, who is anointed of God. His sword is anointed by God. We see the case of Gideon, who's anointed by God to overcome the enemies. And we see Balaam, who is a prophet of God. Three anointed, because you can't be a prophet you can't walk in the office of a prophet unless you're or, or, uh, anointed and ordained by God. So you see three anointed, ordained in their own ways by God who fall into idolatry. And so my title is Discerning the Spirits because all of these people, uh, all three of these leaders had people following them. Jehu. Had, he was the commander, so he had an army, and then eventually he had a nation. The Lord said, your family's going to rule to the third, fourth generation, you know. And so we see um, Gideon, you know, who his, you can read the history of his family. You know, they're asking him to, hey, rule over us. He's leading a nation. And then you see 
uh, Balaam, I don't know where he's from, you know, uh, but he obviously had some sort of influence to where the kings would send their coalition to him to try and seduce him to curse the nation of Israel. So when you look at our modern day church, there are a lot of anointed people. The hand of God is on their life and it is undeniable, but their way is perverse before the Lord. What does perverse mean? Perversion is a crookedness. Kind of like the difference between <laughs> straight and not straight. You know, we kind of say broken wristed, you know, sort of as a slang, you know. It's, it's indicating that it's not straight. It's not straight. The way of the Lord is straight. The way of the enemy is crooked. But my Bible says that he'll make the crooked way straight <laughs> if you want him to. And so we serve a God who walks a straight line. He doesn't veer to the right or to the left. And he calls us to do the same thing. And we have a lot of people who are anointed. They are gifted. They are called. Many of them are legitimately ordained. But there is something else in the mixture. Because you don't just wake up overnight and decide to lead an entire nation astray. You don't wake up overnight and decide to start preaching a false gospel from the pulpit or on TV or writing a book or hosting a conference. That does not happen overnight. What happens is the enemy who operates through, through the power of suggestion will suggest things to you. Um, Apostle Brian Meadows in his sermon, Be Open on YouTube, phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. I've listened to it countless times. He gives an amazing illustration of a strong man, uh, a strong man an angelic perspective as well as a human perspective. So a strong man in a human perspective would be somebody who's well-known, somebody who's famous, someone who's out there killing it. You know, it could be a celebrity, it could be a politician. In this case, we're talking about a strong man in terms of a minister who could be maybe well-known. And so the strong man over a region or a prince, if you will, will come in and seduce the strong man. Again, not talking about sexual seduction, although what he seduces him with could be sexual. There's no telling. He comes in and starts whispering these thoughts, starts preaching, if you will, starts giving these thoughts to this earthly strong man, to this human strong man, and saying, oh, you should do this. Uh, the example he used was, you should um, marry gay people. You should officiate their weddings. And you start sliding that in because it's popular. You know, and then you have no discernment, you have no checks and balances, you have no accountability, and so you decide to do that. And he just painted a really excellent picture of that. But that's that's what these spirits would do. They will find somebody. I mean, look at look at Bishop Pearson. That did not happen overnight. I still honor him as the man who was one of the first black evangelists, televangelists, you know, who he was a pioneer. That's probably why the enemy attacked him like that. That is why the enemy will form certain weapons against people because you are a strong man. That's not something you sit up and talk about them for. That's something you pray and cover them for before it even happens because the enemy is seeking whom he may devour. He's seeking whom he may deceive. Um, when you're talking about the realm of Jezebel, one thing I always teach is that if she can't sway you or seduce you, then she will try to slander you. And if she does not succeed in first swaying or seducing you, in slandering you, then she will try to slay you. <laughs> and I do not mean slay in a fashion sense. I mean she tries to kill you. So it's one of those three, but swaying is very popular because if I can get you on my side, if I can get you to become the mousepiece, uh, the mouthpiece of a doctrine of devils, uh, of a seducing spirit, of a perverse spirit, then I don't have to kill you. I don't have to scare you. I don't, you know, I actually got that mixture, uh, that, that order mixed up. If she can't seduce you or sway you, then she will try to scare you. And if she can't scare you, then she will try to slay you. That's what it is. Seduce or sway, scare or slay. <laughs> and so if, if she sways you, if she seduces you, then she doesn't have to scare you. If she sways or seduces you, then she doesn't have to kill you. She doesn't have to slay you. And so 
these spirits will target these leaders who are absolutely 1,000% anointed, who have undoubtedly, with evidence, the hand of God on their life. But this is why the people of God need discernment. And I'm not talking to people in leadership. Yes, people in leadership should need discernment, but I'm talking to us. I'm talking to you and me. I'm talking to the lay people. I'm talking to the people sitting in the pews, the people who are serving the leadership. We need discernment because we need to know when something is off in the pulpit. Why should you be surprised when somebody gets into a pulpit and starts preaching a false gospel? Your spirit should have already alerted you that something was off. Your spirit should have already let you know that there is a spirit that is trying to come in. And you should have already been praying against it or you should have already been out depending on what God's ruling to you in that situation is. You should have either been praying against it, interceding effectively, um, quietly, or with a trusted, trustworthy group of intercessors who are not witches, praise the Lord, and trying to control the man or woman of God. You should have been interceding against it, or you should have been leaving. And leaving does not mean you stop interceding. Now, you know when the burden lifts from you in terms of intercession. That's a different topic for a different day. But you should be praying against that thing. Because these things do not appear overnight. That's something I always teach my students. It's something I always write. Error does not appear overnight. Error is something that is a long time in the making. It's when the enemy comes with a thought he comes and he plants the thought in your mind. Now the thought coming to your mind is not a sin. The thought coming to your mind is not a problem. That's just the devil doing his job. That doesn't mean, it's, it's like a temptation. The temptation coming to you is not a sin. You harboring the temptation, you dwelling on the temptation, you nurturing and making that temptation your own, and then eventually falling into that, that's what makes it a sin. You dwelling on it in a positive manner, and then you acting on it. Those are the things that makes it a sin. So it is with seducing spirits. When a seducing spirit comes to you and tries to seduce you into another spirit that is not the spirit of truth, it's because you've entertained it. When, you, when that happens and when you're standing in the pulpit becoming a mouthpiece for this spirit, it's because you've been entertaining it. When these pastors, there's some pastors, there's a TV show, I won't mention the name. Um, Y'all probably know what I'm talking about. Um, I think it was maybe a couple years ago. But there was a show full of ministers, <laughs> and they had an actress on the show who was promoting open marriage. First of all, what? <laughs> Why is she on the show? I'm confused. When did she make a profession of, of her faith in Jesus and the Lordship of Jesus? But that's another topic because we don't check for confessions these days. We don't check for confessions. <laughs> and so she's on the show promoting open marriage. And then one of the ministers says, oh, well, I was in an open marriage. I just forgot to tell my ex-wife. Ha, 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 ha. And he says this on national television. And apparently he apologized later, whatever. But you said it. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this is, you, this, you're fine with this. Obviously, you invited her on the show. You're fine with this. And so from that extent, someone should not be surprised because if you were discerning the spirit in which that minister was operating, that should not have been overly surprising to you. I'm not saying it won't have a little bit of shock value, but this is why we need to be on our faces. And this is not a, um, well, oh, I know what spirit you're of, so I don't want nothing to do with you. There's something to be said, according to New Testament, you know, not just Old Testament, but New Testament, when, when people are um, in sin and they are unrepentant, Jesus tells you, I forget what chapter, he tells you, what method to go through. You know, if you have an issue with your brother, go and speak to them. If they don't want to hear you, go and bring somebody else. If they don't want to hear y'all, then go with a few people. <laughs> if that doesn't work, 
address them before the congregation. If they still do not repent, have nothing to do with them. That's where the Amish get shunning from. I mean, they're legalistic with it, but that's where they get it from. Don't even eat a meal with them. You know, and even in, uh, in the epistles, Paul talks about turning over a man who is in sexual sin that was even unheard of to the pagans. You know, <laughs> that was something that you would even would make pagans squeamish. You know, he says, turn this man over to Satan. And we see later that once they turned him over to Satan, which is not, frankly, popular teaching these days, um, this man was convicted by the Holy Spirit and came back into the congregation. But we don't do that. We're just like, well, oh, we have to be loving. We have to, we have to take care. We don't do what the Bible tells us to do. We don't do what Jesus told us to do. We don't do what the Apostle Paul told us to do. We just, we make up our own warm, fuzzy theology that fits better with our spiritual immaturity frankly. <laughs> and so we don't do what scripture tells us to do. So that's probably why we don't see a lot of repentance in true, true repentance that bears fruit worthy of repentance taking place. But back to discerning of the spirits, we need to discern the spirit because if you are under someone who is operating in all spirits, and let me tell you, the words can be 1000% right, but the spirit can be off. It can be completely off. Don't believe me? You can turn to, what is it, Acts chapter 16, where there is a young slave girl following Paul and, who is it, Barnabas, somebody. He's following Paul and his fellow laborer around saying, these men are coming to proclaim the gospel of the Most High. You know, what she's saying is accurate, but her spirit was off. Now, Paul was able to deceive by his agitation by his grief, you know, different versions will say he was grieved. Uh, some translations will say he was distressed. You know, there are different translations there, but he was grieved, distressed, agitated, frustrated, fed up, whatever phrase or terminology you want to use. He was just done, okay, because he knew something about it was off. There is such a thing as divine annoyance. There is such a thing as supernatural disinterest, <laughs> There is such a thing as these things. I've experienced them. If you talk to other people who flow a lot more strongly in discernment, in the prophetic and intercession, and have the gift of discerning the spirits, not just the muscle of discernment that everyone should have, especially who's a believer, but you talk to these people, and they, they'll tell you the different ways they discern things. But somehow, Paul was able to discern, okay, what this young woman is saying is correct. But the spirit in which she's saying it or the motive for her saying it is not of God. And he was able to cast the spirit of divination or python out of that woman. And she was delivered. I don't know what happened to her after that, but we know that they put uh, uh, Paul and his partner in jail for what they did. Because um, she, she was bringing in money. She was bringing in money for her slave masters, and she was probably benefiting in some way as well. And so we need to discern the spirit. There is a particular minister. I ain't naming no names. That's not what this is. There's a particular minister. I literally get sick to my stomach when I hear his voice. Sick, like immediately stomach starts nodding up the moment I hear his voice. I cannot do it. But this is someone who's on everyone's platforms. Everybody's teaming up with them. Churches under this ministry popping up everywhere. But no one is discerning. And the thing is, I see the hand of God on his life. I see it clear as day. But I also see what else is in the mix. And the thing is, whether you're a parent, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a minister in any uh, capacity. You do not impart what you teach. You impart the spirit in you. You impart what you are. And so let me pick something, something random. Okay. Let's pretend, God forbid, and this would never happen in the name of Jesus. Let's pretend I'm like a down low lesbian, right? Y'all don't know it. You don't, there's no evidence of it anywhere that you can find, that you can see, but I'm a down low lesbian, or this is something that I'm entertaining, but I'm on here teaching to you. I'm on here teaching to you. Somebody with discernment should be able to pick up on what you can't see, because that's what discernment is for. 
Discernment is to be able to discern. I told someone this earlier tonight. Discernment is not the difference between good and evil. Most people, even without Jesus, children who do not even, you know, they're not even the age of accountability yet. Most of them will know the difference between good and evil. That's pretty generic. <laughs> Unless there's just something really twisted about you. You know the difference between good and evil. Discernment, rather than discerning, a, we can talk about discernment or discerning. A, that will let you know the difference between what is good and what looks good. What's good and what sounds good. What's good and what only seems good. It will let you know the difference between what is good and what is God. That's what we need discernment for. And that could be in relationships. And relationships are not just romantic. Certainly includes that. Please use discernment in your romantic relationships. Because you'll wind up married to somebody who's supposed to be in ministry assignment. You'll wind up married to somebody that you was never even supposed to meet. <laughs> you'll wind up married to someone who does not support nor celebrate nor encourage the call of God in your life. You'll wind up married to some. You can be wind up married to a witch. <laughs> you know, you need discernment. These days, you could be wind up married to, I mean, you could be a man married to another man by accident. You could be a woman married to another woman by accident because these surgeries are getting better. These fake hormones are getting better and stronger. It's getting more and more difficult to tell. So unless I see a birth certificate, of these people will even have their birth certificates changed. You know what I mean? That's just one example. But you need discernment. Um, we hear these stories, you know, I just heard, um, I think late last night today, there was um, a, we've been having really bad weather in terms of rain and winds and things like that in North Carolina. There was a weather guy tracking a storm and his photographer who had a tree fall on their car, I guess, and killed them. Discernment will let you know, okay, we, we shouldn't go down this road. We should go a different way. Or maybe we should leave at this time instead of leaving at another time. Or we should not go to this mall. We should go to a different mall. Or we should go in this store and not that store. You know what? I should keep my children home from school today because school shootings are real. You know, discernment is real. And I, I, I will always say this. Um, there was a minister who was preaching, um, I don't think it was terribly long after the Charleston shooting, and he said what I thought, and my friend was watching on a different coast, and she texted me at the same time, because it was a live service, and we were texting each other at the same time, saying, oh my God, I thought the same thing, and he was saying that in the Charleston shooting, it is a shame that there was nobody there who discerned what was in their midst. Now, people who are whatever, touchy, whatever, will tell you, oh, well, that's unfeeling, that's cold-hearted, but it could have saved somebody's life. Would that have been unfeeling and cold-hearted if someone had discerned what was coming or discerned that just something was coming and stayed home from Bible study that night? Or better yet, uh, enlisted the saints to pray and prayed effectively so that uh, attack was averted or so the young man was saved, delivered. Is there something cold hearted about that? No, we need to serve. We got bridges falling on cars. You know, people walking on the bridges. You know, we've got natural disasters. We've got flash floods. We've got all of these things happening. You mean to tell me that you don't need the discernment and the gift of discerning of spirits? You mean to tell me that you wouldn't have wanted to discern the spirit in that person who, who molested or raped somebody? Because most times in those cases, it's somebody we know. It's somebody the family knows. And this is not to place blame on anybody, but this is to say there are far, 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 far too many situations that are happening on a very daily basis. It's looking like Matthew 24 up in here. There are situations happening on a daily basis on um, a, a global scale, national scale, regional scale, local scale, personal scale, um, that, would, uh, that leads you to need this gift, 
to, to need uh, the gift of discernment in terms of wisdom, keen uh, wisdom and discernment. And let me, let me tell you about that because people don't like judgment. That's another word for discernment, which is something every believer should have. Um, First Corinthians uh, 2.15 says, but he who is spiritual judges all things. All things. It's not just the things we want to. This is not talking about being judgmental. This is not saying um, treat people funny. This is not saying um, be negative. A lot of people who don't have ears to hear and eyes to see themselves will hear discernment and say, oh, you're just being negative. Well, you don't have any discernment. No, because my Bible says, he who is spiritual judges all things. And what does that look like? Um, should I eat that food? <laughs> should I walk down this dark alley? Should I let my child go to school today? Should I leave a little bit earlier or a little bit later? You know, and, and it doesn't always mean that you even know what it is you're discerning specifically. It could just mean that your spirit is picking up on something. And even though you can't define it, you know it's there. And so what do you do? You don't freak out. The Bible doesn't call us to operate in a spirit of fear, but the Bible does call us to pray. It does call us to pray. Why would you pray? Because when you pray against the attacks of the enemy, it means that either those things, if they're not something that's ordained by God <laughs> um, in attacks of the enemy or not, but um, if a situation is not ordained by God, then that situation can either be lessened or it can be eradicated. It can be removed completely. Where's an example of that? The story of Abraham interceding for Lot and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if there had been just 10 righteous people in that whole five city valley, then God would have spared the whole valley. Because that's what he promised Abraham. But because he could only find Lot and Lot's wife and Lot's two daughters, then the, then the city wasn't, um, uh, then the, all the, the cities of the valley were destroyed. But Zoar was not destroyed. Because Lot said, hey, can I go to Zoar? And the angels were like, fine, you can go. I would advise you against it, but you can go. But Zoar was preserved. And then all, all the other cities, all the major cities around Zoar were destroyed, fire and brimstone, on biblical proportions. <laughs> and so, I mean, that's not something to laugh at. But you get the idea. Everything around them was destroyed, you know. And so things can, things can shift depending on what we pray and how we pray. But a lot of people will either just adopt a spirit of fear and do nothing, or they'll cloak their laziness with the spirit of fear, you know, and just choose to do nothing. Or they're taught that there's nothing they can do, which is a terrible teaching because you're not helpless as a believer. I, I do realize it feels that way sometimes, but you're not helpless when you're armed with prayer. These are weapons. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so we have these weapons available to us. God himself will go before us. The glory of the Lord is our regard. We have the whole armor of God. If you want more weapons, go read through the Psalms and see the different weapons that David talked about and how those relate to us in the spirit how we can war with these things, how he makes our feet like hands feet and trains our, our, our hinds feet and trains our hands for war. You know, we have weapons, not tangible weapons, not physical weapons. This is not saying go shoot up somewhere and go grab a bow and arrow and go Hunger Games or Legolas and somebody. That's not what I'm saying. But we do have weapons that are available to us. And discernment is a weapon. The sons of Issachar had discernment to understand the times and the seasons. A lot of times when we think of discernment, especially as it pertains to the gift of the spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, we think, oh, that's just something that only certain people have. Well, it may be something that only certain people have, but you can ask for it. And see, the translation is kind of funky. You know, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 1, it says, now concerning spiritual, I do not want you to be ignorant. So he's saying, number one, don't be ignorant. But he identifies them as spiritual gifts in a lot of translations. But really, it's just the manifestation of the Spirit of God. It's a good thing. So if you ask for it from the Lord and your name is not Simon the Sorcerer, he will give it to you. <laughs> if you ask for it with right motives, 
if you need it for your purpose and what he's called you to do, he will give it to you. He is a good, good father. A good, good father. He's not going to give you an eel when you ask for some fish. He's not going to give you a stone when you ask for bread. He's a good father. Every good and perfect thing comes down him because he's, or comes from him because he's the father of lights. He doesn't want to take from you unless taking from you is pruning that will make you better, that will make you healthier, that will make you more mature, more holy, more whatever it is he needs you to be at that particular point in time. Um, but we need discernment. So if you don't have the discerning, ask for it. And there are a lot of people out there, you have it, you may not know how to articulate it, but you have it on some level. Things will rub you the wrong way. Again, I talked about this in, a, in an earlier um, Facebook Live, but we have, um, we have um, discernment that uh, sort of mirrors our natural senses, uh, including a sixth sense. We have um, spiritual sight, which is something even pagans understand. We have spiritual sight. You know, we have um, spiritual uh, smell for some people. We, we can taste and see that the Lord is good. You know, we can taste things in the spirit. There are things we can touch in the spirit, you know, uh, or things that can touch us. You know, there are, um, we can hear in the spirit. You know, he who has eyes to see, he who has ears to hear. You know, there are all of these things in scripture. They're absolutely there. And then we have sort of our sixth sense, which is just a perception, and that deals with our heart. And I've said this before, you know, those who are pure in heart will see God. So we need to ask God to purify us. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew in me a right spirit. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. So if we ask God to purify our hearts, it will clear, uh, bring clarity to our vision. It will bring clarity to our spiritual senses. Perception deals with the state of the heart. So you'll just, have you ever just known something and you don't know how you knew it? You didn't taste it. You didn't hear it. You didn't see it. You didn't smell it. <laughs> you know, you didn't feel it, but you knew it by the spirit of God. That could, that could even be in a dream. That could be in a vision. That could be in your waking life. You know what I mean? It could be any of those things. Um, that is your spiritual perception. That is your discerning. You could discern that something is off about someone. You know what? I don't want to leave my kids over there. You know what? You can't spend the night over there, little Johnny and little Susie. Um, I love you, and you can still be friends with them, and they can spend the night over here, but you can not spend the night over there. <laughs> you know, you may not be able to articulate it, but you have a gift. You are not crazy. You are not Listen to me. You are not crazy. You're not crazy. You're discerning. And when you have something that is in your care, whether that's uh, a spouse, whether that's children, that, that could be your biological children, stepchildren, whatever kind of children, children that you teach, if you are a pastor with a flock, if you have mentees, if you have people, you are in some capacity responsible for you think God doesn't want to arm you with every possible weapon every possible tool every possible gift that is necessary to best take care of them he's a shepherd and if we're being transformed into his image wouldn't he want us to be good shepherds in our own right wouldn't he want us to be able to look out for our spouses and say, babe, that's probably not a great idea. Did you do a business deal with this person? It'd be best if you could articulate why, but even if you can't, wouldn't it be nice if you could give your spouse a heads up? Or if you could say, you know what, that teacher is not the best one for my students. There's something off. You know, or whatever it is, God wants us to have these gifts. He wants us to be a prophetic people because what happens when people do not have a prophetic vision? They cast off restraint. They perish. Whatever translation you read, it's not a good uh, summation. <laughs> it's not a good situation when the people have no ability to perceive the spirit, to perceive the things of the spirit. And this is not just about other spirits. Yes, you can identify other spirits. You can identify the spirit of God. You can identify heavenly spirits. You can identify demonic spirits. You can identify human spirits. You can identify motives 
and intents of the heart, you can perceive atmospheres. You can perceive what is a spirit in a region. You can perceive what is going on, what has gone on in a room, in a place, in a state, in a city, in a region, in a nation, in the world. You, you, there are so many things that can be discerned. Again, the sons of Issachar discern the times and the seasons. There is a time and a season to everything, Ecclesiastes 3. So there are so many different things that can be discerned. It's not just about mm, that person as a spirit. <laughs> it's not just about that. It's not just a, um, it's not just about you. It could be for somebody else. It could be God leading you to look out for somebody else. And this pairs with prophetic gifting. This pairs with intercession. If God is calling intercessors, and he is. If he's calling for watchmen, and he is. If he's calling for us to be a prophetic people, and he is, then we need discernment. What is the job of a watchman to stand on the wall, to be in position to see what is coming? So when they see what is coming, they can warn the necessary people. And let me tell you, as a nugget, um, their job was not always just to cry out to the whole place and tell them what was coming. No, because sometimes that could be mass pandemonium. <laughs> sometimes you need to, there's only a specific set of people you need to tell. What does that mean? What's the translation? Don't post every prophetic word you get on Facebook. Don't post everything you discern on Periscope or Twitter or Instagram. Everything is not for public consumption. It takes discernment to know where and how you need to dispense what you have discerned. You need discernment to operate in discernment. <laughs> it's a catch-22, but it's, it's an amazing gift. And so we need that. We absolutely need it. So I think I'm done with that. I didn't look at my notes once <laughs> outside of looking at the pictures that I needed. But we need discernment. We need discernment to discern the leaders who are over us. And that's not to judge them. That is not to correct them. Correction flows from above. It does not flow from beneath upward. Nope, it flows downward. This is so you can govern yourself accordingly and those who belong to you. This is so you can say, okay, I love you, but I can't have you pouring into my life. It's not a good idea that you mentor me. I've had to do that before. Thankfully, the Lord had it, so I didn't have to say anything. He just worked it out so where they never end up actually taking me under their wing. But these are things that have to be discerned. You have to discern, is this relationship over? And again, I'm not even speaking specifically of romantic. This could be any relate. This could be a ministerial relationship. Is this relationship at its end? Is this relationship uh, dormant right now? Is this relationship something that needs to be adjusted? Um, these are all things that need to be discerned. Um, so switching gears a little bit, I am wrapping it up. Um, if you guys see pinned in the comments, I have um, a prophetic training that I'm doing coming up in July that I'm very excited about called Judging the Prophetic. It is based off of my book and specifically my workbook that some of you may not know I have, both Judging the Prophetic. So you have the book and you have Judging the Prophetic, the workbook. This is based off of the class I taught for Kairos Ministerial Institute in the fall of 2017. And so I'm wanting to take that and teach you guys as well. So I have eight lessons I'm going to be teaching. I'm going to be teaching on the spirit of prophecy. I'm going to be teaching teaching on prophetic administrations, teaching on uh, the order in prophetic ministry, soulish prophetic ministry, um, prophecy by familiar spirits, the spirit of Jezebel, as well as witchcraft. So I'm going to be covering all of these things in seven or eight different lessons. And then I'm going to, um, I'm trying to line up some different speakers who can come in as well as sort of guest teachers to do uh, one particular topic um, each. And so um, if you want to learn more about this, I encourage you to click the link in the comments, go to judgingtheprophetic.eventbrite.com, sign up. There are two registration options there. If you want to sign up and register with just the PDF books, you can do that at a certain rate. And then if you want to sign up and actually get the print books, you can do that as well. So this is going to be taking place July 9th 
through 20th. That's not every day. It's Monday through Friday. And what it is, it will be in a Facebook exclusive group format, and we will do live teaching. So uh, there will be time to ask questions and different things like that. We can actually be able to interact in the group. So every morning, we will be doing Monday through Friday, um, the weeks of the 9th through the 20th of July. That's two weeks two Mondays through Fridays. Um, I will be teaching in the mornings, and then if we have a guest speaker, um, then they will come on likely in the evenings, unless it's one of the last couple days um, on the 19th or 20th. And so still um, finalizing the schedule, but I'm very excited, and I'm hoping you guys will check it out and sign up and register, because I'm excited. I'm excited. I can feel sort of my teaching mantle expanding. And so um, I would like you to be part of that expansion. So um, if you have any questions, comments, let me know. You can inbox me um, through this, my personal profile. You can inbox me on my page, which is the same name as my personal profile. And just hit me up and let me know if you have any particular questions about this particular training. I'm excited. No, this is not for profits. This is for everybody. This is for people, you know, I wrote the book Judging the Prophetic for lay people as well as for people who are flowing in the gift. Um, and so this is for everybody. So if you are interested in learning more about the prophetic in any aspect, just like we did tonight, um, this is for you. This is for you. And I think it's a great, right? You can go and check it out. And again, you have two different options between the print books versus the PDF books. And so um, hit me up. Um, if you are watching the replay, thank you for watching this. Please like, comment, and share. Share, share, share. And you all have a wonderful evening, and I will be back soon. Bye-bye.